film, we invited him to come and have a weekend with us, and this is it. Um, this is a documentary that was actually done by Advent Health, along with some other co-sponsors, and it is about six people who made significant lifestyle changes. So um, enjoy this, and we'll begin now. In the wee hours of the morning, I heard my mom cry out. And we raced up to their bedroom, and he was gone. He was 58 years old, and he was gone. They said, we can give you medicine to slow down, but you know, eventually you're going to lose your vision, and you know, the nerve damage is you know, going to lead to amputation. How many people have had their loved ones die from preventable disease? Heart attack is the number one killer of Australian women. Nearly half the U.S. adult population meet the new criteria of high blood pressure. Mexican obesity rates are now higher than in the United States. One third of Americans who have strokes are under age 65, sometimes much younger. Around 4 million people in the U.K. have type 2 diabetes. If you just see one patient with a heart attack and then another patient with high blood pressure and another patient with diabetes, at some point you gotta just back up and say, what is causing all of this? We think the best thing for you to do is to have an amputation. You know, we're taught to treat diseases after they occur. We're not taught how to prevent them in the first place. There's this basic lack of training for doctors when it comes to nutrition, but that's changing. In our studies over the last almost 40 years now, we found there's a common treatment for so many of these different conditions. I'd never imagined this much of a dramatic change in a year, and I never imagined feeling this good this quick. I want to feel better. It's, it is about the weight. I'd love to get the weight off. I know that I need to get it off for my joints, but I'm 36 years old. I just want to be healthy. I want to enjoy my kids, enjoy my grandkids. I cannot imagine missing one thing. My family has been devastated by chronic disease. My mother was diabetic for 33 years. She did have a kidney transplant. She uh, was legally blind. She had many, many years of dialysis, many, many years of shots, injections, and pills, and ultimately passed away at the young age of 61 years old. My oldest sister also battled diabetes. My oldest brother, uh, David, unfortunately at the young age of uh, 40, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He passed in 2002, actually just two months after my mother passed away. 
My twin brother, Joe, he, uh, we're 47 right now, going on 48. He's been diabetic over a decade, and just about four months ago, he advised us he, he had a heart attack. My little sister, she's been diabetic many, many years, over a decade as well. And then the youngest brother is Martin. He is 43 years old. He was diagnosed with diabetes at a young age, in his early teens, 13 or 14 years old. So he's had diabetes for approximately 30 years now. He has had his right leg amputated. He has had a kidney and pancreas transplant. He's legally blind. He does dialysis three times a week, and he takes 25 medications every single day. And everything that I was ever taught, everything that I was ever led to believe, everything I'd ever read basically was telling me, hey, Hispanics have a high percentage of uh, diabetes. It's in your genes, it's just part of who you are. It was about four and a half years ago. My mother actually gave me a book. She had seen it on Huffington Post, and it was the China study. As I read that book, all of these, this, this light bulb just went off in my head, and it was just like all these puzzle pieces came together in my mind. And it fundamentally changed the way I think about and the way I practice medicine. We have this, uh, this acute care model in healthcare today, and it was designed 100 years ago to treat communicable diseases and injury. And we're still trying to treat chronic disease now with that same acute care model, but it doesn't work. We're trying to treat diabetes and heart disease the way we treat strep throat with pills, but it doesn't work. The most important thing for people to remember is that health is not a matter of chance. And it's not a matter of your destiny being written on your genes and it's absolutely immutable. There is so much that you can do to stay healthy or to turn your health around if it's been compromised. I've been doing work in this field for 40 years, and part of the reason that I spend so much time doing research is that the whole point of research is to find out what's real and what isn't, what's true and what isn't. And everything that we've done was thought impossible when we first started doing it. And so when we show in well-controlled scientific studies with state-of-the-art scientific measures and the leading scientists in the field that we work with, and we show that things that were thought impossible actually may not be, uh, may be very possible, it really empowers, at this point, millions of people with new hope and new choices. And awareness is always the first step in healing, which is why this video is so important, because we can really educate people and let them know that uh, these simple changes can have powerful benefits. My life was um, out of control, and I was not being able to participate in things that I wanted to do anymore. My story starts um, a long time ago with a lot of issues with overeating and I was in my 49th year and it occurred to me I wasn't going to see 50. It was a lot of sitting on the couch, watching a lot of television and eating and everyone didn't always see the eating because I did that after they left for school or before you know in the car there was a lot of secretive eating going on so I think there was always this she must have a metabolic disorder because how could she be that heavy and I knew I mean it's you know I knew what was happening I, I knew about all the things that they didn't know about and finally at 380 pounds and diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and hypertension on medication, I decided to make a commitment to a completely different lifestyle of eating. I think a lot of people understand fruits and vegetables are good for you, but they don't know how good the good stuff is, and they have no idea how bad the bad stuff is. It's sad, but I, can, I think I can say this honestly, probably 95% of America has no idea how to eat. In the old days, we liked to listen to mama. And mama told us, you know, eat your vegetables. Okay? And uh, the truth is, uh, animal products were a little more expensive, so there was less of them, the, the servings were smaller. Life has changed now. We're now listening 
to mamas that have not heard mamas talk about common sense nutrition for a number of generations. We're now listening to advertisers who are telling us, you know, this is what you need to feel happy. Nutritious, delicious, above all else, beef. It's what's for dinner. Got milk? Ah, the power of cheese. Eggs, incredible energy for body and mind. There's an entire industry that has an economic incentive to sell people processed foods, restaurant foods, foods that contain a lot of animal products. And then on the other hand, you also have people that are addicted to those products. We know that salt and fat and sugar are highly addictive. And so because of these addictions and their preferences, they would prefer to ignore the science than to change the way that they eat. You'll fall in love with after just one taste. They're chemists that spend their whole lives, you know, working on the bliss point. But now the industry uses that natural, healthy urge against us, right? The ripest peach in the world is not as sweet as Fruit Loops, right? For example, an apple that's not ripe has maybe nine calories in a bite. It tastes sour and doesn't taste very good. An apple that's just a little bit riper that has one more calorie in it, that is now pleasant. And so the difference between nine calories and 10 calories in your mouth, the single calorie is the difference between you being completely unmotivated to eat that apple and being motivated. If you think about putting that same piece of apple in your mouth, except it came from a chocolate apple, so now that's 100 calories. So nine calories is lousy, 10 calories is good. What do we think 100 calories is gonna do? It's gonna flood the dopamine pathway and it's gonna result in an addictive-like pleasure response that's gonna be very hard to talk people out of. I was a fast food junkie. My body was telling me, you need that sugar, you need that fat, you need that salt. And so I, I was going through the drive through all the time. In 2002, the doctors uh, advised me that I was diabetic and they wanted to put me on medications right away. And I was kind of fighting with the doctor, saying, hey, let, let me try to work out more. Can I exercise more? Maybe I'll try to eat better. So uh, for a couple years, I was, I was fighting them and, and trying to stay away from all the medications. But in, in 2004, uh, my, my levels were just still out of control and ultimately I started taking medications. The next thing you know, hey, your, the dosage goes up, right? Your sugars are still going in the wrong direction, so we're gonna up the dosage. Now we have this predicament where we need to give you a second medication uh, to try and force your pancreas to secrete more insulin to help you with your diabetes. Uh, along the way it was, oh, your cholesterol is a little high now. Let me give you yet another medication to help you with your cholesterol situation. Oh, by the way, your blood pressure is a little out of control. Let's give you yet another medication. Ultimately got to the point, my sugars were still out of control uh, and I had to begin to take insulin shots uh, twice a day. So in 2011, at the age of 43, I was injecting myself twice a day with insulin. I was poking myself, checking to see how my sugar levels were doing throughout the day, and I'm taking these four oral medications as well. And I'm sitting here going, I can't believe that I'm heading down this path. Look at these shots, look at all these uh, pills that I'm taking every single day. And I, mean, I wasn't feeling good, right? I mean, all these medications and the side effects. So I was basically beginning to kind of accept the fact that, hey, this is just my destiny. This is where my, I've seen my family all go through it. And here now, it, my turn was knocking at the door. I even asked my doctor, I said, when I began to take my insulin shots, I said, hey doc, will, will I ever get off this insulin? And he flat out told me, no, you're gonna be on insulin the rest of your life. When we are used to eating a certain way, we resist change. So if I, as a doctor say, you gotta change everything you're eating. What, what's, what you've been eating hurts you. It's understandable that a person would be resistant and that's good. So I don't think of resistance and questions as bad. I think of it as the person saying, here are the doors that I need you to open for me. I had a really wonderful childhood. I grew up in the country on about three acres, and I have two wonderful parents who are very loving and nurturing and spent a lot of time actually outdoors and playing and in the barn with you know animals, and it was a really wonderful childhood. I grew up as Seventh-day Adventists and vegetarians. I very rarely ate meat. A lot of cheese and eggs to replace meat. 
processed foods too, cereals and those types of food I ate growing up. So I started having some health issues shortly after I got married and actually started out with my thyroid. I was working night shift as a nurse in the labor and delivery unit and started having some fatigue and I actually did fine after I got on the medication and really didn't have any health issues outside of that um, until later on. Things started changing when I actually got pregnant with our first child. Uh, about the 27 week mark, they do a glucose tolerance test. And I failed it quite significantly to the point where they said, you are gestational diabetic and you're going to have to go see an endocrinologist and do some food counseling, but don't worry, it'll go away. You'll just have to be careful. But if you, you know, exercise and keep yourself healthy, you'll be just fine. Well, the opposite kind of happened for me. I actually had horrible muscle weakness. And so our daughter would be hungry and I would be struggling to open up the baby food jars. And then I started having intermittent blurred vision. And so I went actually to the eye doctor and she said, well, you know, you could have, you know, diabetes. It, it could have come back. The one night that was just the clincher was our daughter, sometimes she'd be fussy in the evenings, and my husband would say, well, you know what I do on the nights you work? I just drive through the coffee shop and I get this frozen coffee and I take our daughter out on a little drive and she's quiet and sleeps. And so we shared one together and came back home and I was a mess. I couldn't sleep, I was having hot, flashes, I was profusely sweaty and shaky, and about, I don't know, midnight, one o'clock in the morning when I was still up feeling nauseated and sick, I got out my blood sugar meter and it was between 350 and 400. So I ended up seeing the doctor and he said, you know, you're a type one, your body just doesn't produce enough insulin anymore. And so it was very disheartening and there was a lot of denial. It's really grieving a loss. You're losing just your health, which is a part of what all of us have the right to enjoy in life. As I've treated patients uh, through the years, I've always tried to describe them, there's this accumulated injury that occurs over time. So people often describe, you know, well, I was just diagnosed with heart disease or cancer or diabetes. And I always tell them, this is something that is accumulated in your body over decades. And now the symptoms are presenting themselves. You have high blood pressure, you have a heart attack, you have a diagnosis of cancer, but what's been happening in your body kind of subclinically, which means we haven't been able to measure the changes, you've been building up degenerative changes, disease, and injury to tissue that finally reaches a tipping point. And when it crosses the tipping point, it manifests itself in measurable symptoms that we can see in imaging studies and lab tests, things that we can tangibly measure to assess disease. So I always describe them, this is like a credit card debt. You know, you have overspent year after year after year, and you have this debt that now needs to get paid back. And you can't just simply make the monthly payments and expect that it's going to go away. You have to pay back big chunks on a regular basis over time. And then, just like credit cards, we have to learn how to manage it wisely. Up until this point, it's not being emphasized at all in our healthcare system. And, and we're not seeing people get healthier. So as much as we do know from the literature, it it's to a degree unethical to not be bringing this up to patients. Most patients come into my office thinking that that's it, that this is their destiny, this is what, you know, was written for them, this is in their family history, so they're supposed to be kind of living this way. In my experience, it's very common for people who have a family history of heart disease to have a family history of eating um, a very poor, low nutritive quality diet, high in junk food, high in salt, sugar, and fat. Just because our bodies have a tendency of going in one direction genetically does not necessarily mean that your body needs to go there. The choices that you make today can impact what happens tomorrow, what happens 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Nutrition in pregnancy is very important because we could affect the genetics of our baby. 
you know, moms who are diabetic could pass on some of those genetics and you can actually change that and reverse that if they eat foods that are, that would promote a good, healthy lifestyle. There are genes for diabetes. There are genes for blood pressure. There are genes for, for heart disease. But those genes aren't dictators. You know, the, the genes for blue eyes, those are dictators. They give orders, you can have blue eyes. The, gene, the genes for diabetes are like committees. They make suggestions, and you can argue with them. You can say, I don't think I'm gonna have diabetes because I'm gonna change my diet and my lifestyle, and I'm gonna push those genes away. And you can do that. And that is, that, that is true for a surprising range of conditions. Being able to work with our families to tell them that what you're doing right now is going to impact not only your life, but your child's life, is a very powerful moment when they capture that. You know, I think uh, the kind of spark for many kids to be, want to be a doctor when they grow up is watching a parent get sick or even die. But for me, it was, it was watching my grandma get better. She was uh, age 65 when she was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease. She had already had so many bypass operations, she basically kind of run out of plumbing at some point. And uh, she confined in a wheelchair, crushing chest pain, sent home to die. There's nothing more they could do for her. And then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of the early lifestyle medicine pioneers and was one of his first patients, featured in his biography. She was one of the death's door people that they took into the clinic, and they wheeled her in, and she walked out. And, you know, I'll never forget that. Um, in fact, she, within a few weeks, she was walking 10 miles a day. It was like this live-in center. You go there, they teach you how to, you know, cook and put your plant-based diet, exercise. And uh, she went on to live another 31 years to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. and. Um, that's what inspired me to go into medicine. Up until recently, we didn't really think of nutrition as being a very strong force. You know, you eat a little bit less carbs and nothing much happens, or you count calories for a few weeks and you lose a few pounds and then you gain it all back. High protein, high fat, that sounds like it's supposed to be good. Butter is bad, now butter is good. There's a whole bunch of confusion about uh, nutrition in the popular press. How many images do I see every day in the television shows, even the cartoons? How many uh, references are there to food? And what percentage of the time is the food bad food? Uh, almost always. Many people that suffer from chronic diseases that are killing them and causing them suffering, diseases such as heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension, things like that, really don't realize that nutrition and targeted nutrition are actually one of the best therapeutic modalities to prevent these kinds of diseases, to treat them, and to even reverse them. Reversing those diseases, which means you don't have to take medications because the disease is gone. It no longer exists. Foods are the cause of diabetes, of heart disease, of many forms of cancer, of hypertension. And if they're the cause, they can also be the solution. That's been a totally new idea for many people, but it's a very powerful one. Heart disease is our number one killer, yet it can be prevented, treated, reversed, without drugs, without surgery, with diet and lifestyle change, particularly diet. A whole food, plant-based diet is more powerful than anything we have in medicine when it comes to some of these chronic diseases. And it wasn't like there was one set of lifestyle changes for reversing heart disease, another one for type 2 diabetes, or for losing weight, or lowering your blood pressure, or your cholesterol. We found that these same lifestyle changes could change all of these. These lifestyle diseases, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, obesity, and really others as well, have a lot of inflammation. One of the benefits of moving to a plant-based diet is there's so many kind of anti-inflammatory things within the plants that help to calm things down. Proteins, especially when they're separated out as in muscle, tend to increase inflammation, whereas plants tend to decrease it. Things like legumes, fruits, vegetables, greens. So decreasing inflammation is a very positive thing when we talk about chronic disease. The body is a natural self-healing machine, and disease is unnatural, avoidable, and even reversible with superior nutrition. 
I've had a number of vegetarians and vegans come to see me as patients, and I was surprised that they're very unhealthy, and in some cases more unhealthy than my patients eating a standard American diet. And so I, I tried to tr understand why this occurred because in my mind I had always thought, well, vegan, vegetarian, optimal health. But what I've seen in their lives is that they have um, excluded animal products for a number of reasons, but they include a number of processed carbohydrates, breads, bagels, cereal, cheese for the vegetarian, sugars. And because of that, they are filling their bodies again with things that are, that are depleting and eroding their health. So just because someone tells me now they're vegan or vegetarian, I don't assume they're healthy. Eat a diet that has a high nutrient per calorie density. Green vegetables are the highest. Colorful vegetables, things like berries, onions, mushrooms, broccoli, carrots, beets. I will typically use the word whole food, plant-based nutrition as the foundation of our plates and not just excluding foods and assuming that we're going to be healthy. Because it's really exclusion of, yes, some foods from the standard American diet, but it's the inclusion of important plant-based nutrition that helps us reverse disease. The foods that do that for you are the ones where their power is very modest, seemingly. The vegetables and the fruits and the whole grains and the beans, those foods have power that you never imagined. If you start eating out of a box, a bag, or a can, everything is getting processed. And then you suddenly see, my God, there are paragraphs of ingredients. You don't want that. Especially you don't want the mono and diglycerides, you don't want the added oil, and there are usually four or five or six different ways that they're just stuffing sugar at you. You don't want that. You want whole food, plant-based nutrition as grown. I grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, my family is very close-knit. We had a very good relationship and I had a very happy childhood. We did have a typical American diet. All the stuff that you think about, you know, hot dogs and chicken wings. And um, I guess I didn't really think about food all that much. I enjoyed it, but I was not overweight as a kid. It was just kind of, you know, part of the day. I played um, many varsity sports. I played volleyball and soccer and swimming, and I did five years of varsity softball. I really noticed my weight became an issue during medical school uh, because at that time I was just studying and working so much throughout the week that it was really all about convenience. Uh, I just went to whatever would be able to keep me awake and give me energy, and usually that was caffeine and sugar and junk food, fast food. During my residency, as this was going on, I started to really feel quite sick. Uh, at one point I was diagnosed with uh, prehypertension. my blood pressure was high. I developed problems breathing. I was really becoming quite short of breath, even going up one flight of stairs or walking a short bit. I would go into a room and sit down and have to take a minute with a patient and it was embarrassing because I was out of breath just from walking to the patient's room. Um, I was having really bad sinus problems. I just overall felt like I was very unhealthy and very much older than my age. But I assumed that was just being a resident. You know, it didn't really occur to me to think about it being due to my diet. I'm not very tall, I'm about 5'5", five five, and I was up over 200 pounds. I was quite heavy and I, I knew it and I didn't like the way I felt or looked, but I started thinking more about how I felt and could this be related to my weight. The ideal is all the different factors, healthy habits, and I actually motivate the, the patient to focus on the whole picture rather than just nutrition. You want to make sure they eat well, drink a lot of water, seven to eight hours of sleeping, especially that deep sleep, deep slow wave sleep. Another thing that I found important and very helpful is exercise. You know, if you do the exercise on a regular basis, there's a pleasure that comes into your uh, life. Being physically fit, being physically active, exercise, these are things that we need to do. And they're fun. 
but it's not going to solve our health and obesity problem. We have to make radical changes on what we put in our mouth. There's a common feeling that, oh, well, patients won't do that. Well, that's nothing is further from the truth because patients will do it depending upon how the message is articulated. So I started, and I started very seriously. I started every meal, three meals a day, making sure that I was eating a nutritarian diet, which consisted mainly of fruits and vegetables, some nuts and seeds, and um, it just, it worked. And in about six months, I lost 120 pounds. And then over the course of maybe another six months to maybe a year, I'm not really sure because I stopped obsessing so much, I lost another 100 pounds. So I lost 220 pounds in that period of time. And uh, the diabetes went away within weeks, almost. And the hypertension also went away and I was able to stop taking Benicar, which is an expensive pharmaceutical. And I started to feel great. My energy level went through the roof. Um, it became much easier. It wasn't such a struggle in, in the beginning. It was, like anything, a big change in your diet. Um, but all of a sudden, it just got easier. And now I'm five years into it. And it's the best thing that ever happened to me. It saved my life, it saved my marriage. And I have a relationship with my children now where I can actually get out there and do things. I'm not sidelined anymore. I exercise regularly. It's the first time in my life that I know when I go in the closet, things are gonna fit. And I know that next year that same size is gonna fit me as well. And that's a huge burden off of my, it's, you know, some people think it's a burden to eat what may be considered a strict regimen, which to me it's not. It's a burden to be a compulsive overeater that's addicted to sugar. That's a burden. I grew up in Texas eating meat four or five times a day, you know, and I liked it. And again, there's no point in giving up something that you enjoy or that I enjoy unless I get something back that's better. So I began eating a plant-based diet when I was 19 because I found I felt better, I looked better, I had more energy, I could think more clearly. And so when you begin to eat healthier foods, many people find they actually begin to prefer them. And whether or not food tastes good is much more a function of how it's prepared than, you know, what type of food it is. You know, and I've learned a long time ago that the best way to make healthy food taste good is to work with a great chef, even if they're not known for cooking healthily, because great chefs know how to make great food, and then say, work within these guidelines, and then it can be delicious and nutritious. You don't have to make those choices. I would argue that uh, animal products all taste about the same. Hey, whether it's a fish or a chicken or a cow or a pig, it's all muscle, unless you're eating organ meats, but most of what we eat is muscle meat. And then it's, of course, flavored, maybe by something the animal ate, and it, but the flavor is not all that much. So when you move into the plant kingdom and you start to focus on plants, you'll discover a lot more textures and a lot more flavors. Stop to think about it. When you go to the restaurant and they prepare that fish for you or that steak, what are they seasoning with? Well, it's plants, it's herbs. That's where the flavors are. So they're finding out new stuff that they've never experienced before. So it's kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a exploration and discovery. They don't feel deprived. And then maybe they'll start feeling better. All of a sudden, the digestion better, their energy's better, their sleep's better, right? And they start noticing these things, and they get more and more, you know, healthy. And then, you know, nothing tastes as good as healthy feels. health journey has really, until I discovered plant-based eating, it really was an, a, a roller coaster. And you know, you hear yo-yo dieting, but really it becomes a yo-yo life. I think the hope I didn't see coming was medical professionals that actually started to help me address some of the issues I was dealing with. You know, you hear the negative side of medical professionals and, you know, those who just giving you a pill and sending you out the door. But there are medical professionals out there that really do care and they want you to be at your best. When I made the change to a Whole Foods plant-based diet, I was able to get off all those medications. Very quickly, within six months, 
I went to the doctor and I was like, you know, I'm really starting to feel dizzy. And he's like, well, your blood pressure is really, you know, quite low. And I think we're gonna have to take you off your medication. And my cholesterol was just dropping. And it's like, I don't think you really need that anymore. And I didn't have acid reflux and all these allergy issues. So all those pills went to the wayside. And so there I was, you know, just left with kind of the core chronic, you know, disease of just my diabetes and my thyroid, but even that improved. You know, medication doses were lowered. I was using 50 to 60 units a day as a type one, and now, you know, I take around 20 units. And so it drastically changed and just revolutionized my whole life. Like I thought I was free, but I didn't really understand what freedom was until I changed my lifestyle. You have more energy, you're more vibrant, you're more happy. And when you make these types of changes in your life and you really decide you're gonna do it, it will radically change your life for the better and you'll never wanna go back. Now, what are you gonna eat? my takeaway, all their meat and all their dairy and all their oil, and they look at me, they go, Dr. McDougall, I got nothing to eat. There's nothing for me to eat at all, nothing. And I say, yes, there is. And then I, I show them the key, which A, you have to know, or you will fail. I show them the starch. You're gonna eat all these marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, and pasta, 101 different types of beans and legumes, and uh, all these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables and some fruit. Those are my four groups, fruits, vegetables, grains, and the bean group. So half of the plate should be fruits and vegetables, then a, the kind of roughly a quarter um, whole grains preferably, and then a quarter protein, not meat, uh, protein, which, you know, and so beans actually count as both protein and vegetables. They get kind of double duty. One rule that I teach folks is that if um, an ingredient label has a bunch of stuff that a seven-year-old couldn't draw a picture of, then it's probably not something that you want to eat. My palate has changed, the things I appreciate. A fresh roasted beet. <laughs> I get really excited about produce. Can you tell? What are the green leafy vegetables? Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. You got it. The fact of the matter is I'm not depriving myself of anything. I mean, I, I'm, I'm having a great time. I'm eating a wide variety of foods. It's even a wider variety than I ate when I wasn't a plant-based eater. The black bean loaf that I made, that was a huge hit in my family. These were former meat eaters, and now they are happy when they come home to the black bean loaf and some steamed broccoli. I think that's a miracle. <laughs> So during my residency, I took an elective with uh, Dr. George Guthrie. Uh, I read his book. I started thinking more about what's in my foods and is this actually good for me or not. So I switched over to not just vegan, but a whole foods, plant-based diet. I cut out processed sugars. I cut out, you know, excess fats. And within a few weeks, I started noticing that my breathing was improving. My sinuses cleared up, my skin cleared up, and the weight fell off pretty quickly. I lost about 40 pounds in four months. As the weight started to fall off, I started to think about adding some exercise in. It feels so good to be able to do that because I could barely walk up a flight of stairs when I was so overweight and so unhealthy. At this point, I'm about 45 pounds down. I'm not done losing weight yet. I definitely have a ways to go still. I would like to, you know, further refine my diet. I think at this point it's pretty good, but there's still some more things I can work on, like, you know, some of the added oils that sneak their way in, I can kind of work on. But it doesn't feel like work. It feels, it feels great. It makes you feel like you're improving yourself. It just feels fantastic. We adopted this lifestyle on December 3rd of 2011. Within days, three to four days, I start to see my sugars plummet, and I'm seeing my weight drop anywhere between five to seven pounds per week. My psoriasis went away. My heartburn, I've not had heartburn since I adopted this lifestyle. And I'm Mexican, I love spicy food. I eat jalapenos and spices, Indian food. My whole body starts to be uh, improving and starting to heal itself. 
So not quite 60 days later, I was off all five of my medications. My health continues to be normal, my A1C levels, my cholesterol levels, my blood pressures. So here I sit at 47 years old, and I'm healthier than I was even 20 years ago. When my wife and I adopted a whole foods plant-based lifestyle, we basically changed the trajectory of my family's future. The fact is that 40% of children born after the year 2000 will develop type 2 diabetes. One of the things that the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is doing, and I'm so proud of the organization for doing this, is that we are developing a patient bill of rights for type 2 diabetes. And essentially what this means is that we know that type 2 diabetes can be prevented and treated and even reversed through lifestyle medicine. And so when a patient comes into the hospital, they have that conversation with their provider about what should I do, doctor, for my type 2 diabetes. Lifestyle medicine isn't being discussed in the same way that bariatric surgery is being discussed, not in the same way that, you know, what medication you might want to take. In fact, last time I checked, there are over 46 medications to treat type 2 diabetes. None of those medications actually reverse type 2 diabetes, but we know that through lifestyle, you can actually reverse type 2 diabetes. So imagine the patient consenting with their physician that this is the way we want to treat our disease, and they're not even given that option of lifestyle medicine to use as a modality to treat their disease. So that is why the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is putting forth this patient bill of right on type two diabetes. And it's not just the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, other organizations are also joining us in this, but we think it's very important that patients understand all the things they can do to help treat and prevent their type two diabetes and not just medications alone. We have a lot more control over our health and our well-being than we had once thought. Not to blame, but to empower. You know, if we're just a victim of bad genes or bad luck or bad whatever, what can you do? But to the degree we realize that these simple choices that we make in our lives each day can make such a profound difference in all aspects of our lives, then that understanding can empower us to make choices that can really make a difference both in our own lives, the lives of the people that we care about, and in a larger context in our planet as well. I've never imagined this much of a dramatic change in a year, and I never imagined feeling this good this quick. I want to feel oh, this better. Is make me cry. It's, it is about mm. the weight. I'd love to get the weight off. I know that I need to get it off for my joints, but I'm 36 years old. I just want to be healthy. I want to wow. enjoy my kids, enjoy my grandkids. I cannot imagine missing one thing. Hmm. So what emotions come to you when you sit and you watch that back? Oh, I just, I don't even recognize that person. That's, it's just amazing that we can get to that point in life and not even see yourself that way. And it's not just, the physical changes, it's mental changes, it's, it's everything about my life is different. And I was just fueling myself with the wrong foods and killing myself from the inside. So I no longer have gallbladder issues. I don't, my hands don't swell up anymore to where I can't put my jewelry on. My skin looks better than it's ever looked. I run five miles a day, five to six days a week. So I am now averaging 30 to 32 miles a week with no joint pain, no medication. This is strictly the food that I'm putting in my body. I have officially lost 102 pounds since going plant-based. So when I reflect back to what was such a fear of mine, which was not being around for my kids, I don't have that fear anymore, not at all. I don't, I don't fear that at all. The only thing I fear is that they can't keep up with me. <laughs> I saw five experts in this city. As the bar president, access to the best health care and advisors the city has to offer. And they all told me that uh, there was nothing you can do. Um, it's in your DNA. Your mother was diabetic your family's diabetic. And after the reversal, I learned it wasn't my DNA, it was my dinner. 
It wasn't where I was born, it was my breakfast, and it wasn't my lineage, it was my lunch. Wow, maybe this is how, maybe it's normal to actually feel great, right? Maybe it's normal to have all this energy, and really, I mean, you know, maybe it's normal not to get sick all the time and not to have these allergies and these joint aches. Be able to maximize your life. It's not a matter of years. It's a quality of life. The most important decision anyone makes every day is what they elect to put in their mouths. The only regret I have is I wish I would have done this sooner. I wish I would have raised my children this way. I wish I would have eaten this way my whole life. We're starting to learn the power of lifestyle medicine, and this is life-changing, not only for our patients, but also for ourselves. I love my food. I'm ridiculous. I love produce departments. I love farmer's markets. You will lose weight. You will lose your high blood pressure. You will lose your diabetes. You will feel better. You will lose your risk for stroke. So there are side effects. I'm now in control of my destiny and my future, not diabetes and not cholesterol and not high blood pressure. I have reversed disease. The damage that hypertension does to your heart and type 2 diabetes, it was reversed. When you do the right thing, you start to heal from the inside. You're, you're made whole. So wasn't that a great film? And it's really good. You can show it to your family and friends if you just go to the Advent Health website or either put it in if, and just put in plant-wise because they have it available for everybody. And we got a glimpse of Dr. Guthrie there. So we're looking forward to he hearing him starting at 7. So we do have a little break now. So see you at 7. <laughs>